Oh, it's what part of our journey. I'll just leave it. Okay. It's really crazy. So we, we're we're not going to see your hand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Only me and Pat got to see the angry. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you so much, all of you, for braving this rain. I must say, I went over to the parish house this morning, and I was like, oh, God, there's no rain. And then, of course, like, as I like, flew, you know, flew out, then I was like, oh, no, no one's going to show up this morning. So thank you all for being here. So we are starting our brand new series on the music of Advent and Christmas, and we have couple different people teaching. We have fabulous Michelle this week. We have, Love you. Love you. Love you. we have Craig teaching next week, and then we'll have Matt closing us out. We will not do the fourth Sunday of Advent, because I know it's Christmas Eve, and you all will probably have some other things that you'll be doing at school time. So, um, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly God, we are so grateful that we can learn together, that we can begin to lean into this new season of Advent, that we can hear new and familiar words that remind us of why we're doing this season, that we're decorating our Christmas trees and why we're celebrating all month long. God, as we open our ears to new music today, may you be with us, may we feel your peace in these moments. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand it off to Michelle. I'll mostly be doing all the slides and things. But well, my partner in crime, no, no put us together. <laughs> 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 this took a whole different journey. I mean, originally kind of balked at the idea because I was thinking very academically about oh. Advent and theologically about Advent. And I thought, how long can we talk about O Como Come Emmanuel? That would be, not be very interesting. So, um, I, I offer you a disclaimer as a choral conductor and a musician that I, I know the distinction between Advent music and Christmas music. Advent music is all about anticipation and expectation, it contains symbols of light and darkness. We sing of prophecies and the hope for Messiah. Christmas sings about that joyous fulfillment up to the birth of Christ. But sometimes the lines get a little blurry. When I was at Villa Walsh, um, preparing Catholic liturgies during Advent, I really had to hear a very strict protocol. In fact, we didn't even decorate at the school, and Audrey and I kind of talked about that, that was pretty traditional. Um, so I know we're familiar with some of Advent carols. Anything off the top of your head? Oh, come. Oh, come. Oh, come. Oh, come. <laughs> I gave an Advent party. How about another one? Come now, long we expect to keep this. Good, okay. And also we think about Bach et al, uh, Sleeper's Wake from Bach, uh, Four and Choice of Child is Born, you can go to the Messiah. So my struggle when Audrey and I started talking together was trying to connect um, what I know theologically and academically about music to the reality of the world that we're living in today. That was a big disconnect. I thought, how can we make this all work? So we had a wonderful conversation, enter Audrey. <clears throat> and as we talked about what this might look like, um, we took a really great journey together and connected our love of art and music and um, kept digging. And boy, did we find some nuggets. These things you're going to hear today are not on your Advent playlist, I assure you. So um, what we're going to do this morning is the result of getting off the beaten path and making some new discoveries. Um, I also found the words of Kate Bowler, who I was introduced to in my Stephen Ministry training by Emily Campbell. And Emily's not here, but thank you, Emily. And um, Hey, if you don't have this book, this is a great book, The Lives We Actually Live or Have. Um, she kind of put into words the struggle of my disconnect, so I'd like to read that to you now. Here we are at the precipice of Christmas. Sounds ominous. Well, that's probably because our bodies instinctively remember the knot of nervous energy that propels us through it all. The busyness, the hustle, the last minute wrapping, the beauty of the first snowfall, or at least the cinematic version on the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> the delight of Christmas lights after they're hung, of course. The would you stop arguing we're supposed to be making memories moments. <clears throat> there are so many desires and longings wrapped up in every parcel, every must make recipe, and must do tradition. We dream of creating a glistening Christmas for our families or friends that makes us tired even before we finished imagining it. 
But what if we could take all those ideals and see what's underneath at the root of it all? It's our hopes for peace and joy and love for ourselves, our people, and for our world. And we say, God, show us again how this goes. How do we bless the Christmas we actually have? Perhaps we can practice our actual lives together this Advent. So, one, three. What does Advent mean to you? Thoughts? Throw a word, thought, no wrong answers. I, I think it's interesting. Um, I think for probably some of us my age, I grew up in the church, but we didn't do Advent. It was Presbyterian too. But um, I, did, I really didn't know about Advent mm -hmm. until I had children in, I guess that was either Kansas City or Des Moines, I'm not sure where. But then we started doing the symbols, we started talking about it, we did a wreath, all of that, and I just found it to be so wonderful and wondered, why didn't I grow up with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my struggle, Lori, because, you know, we know about it, we talk about it, we light the candles, but I never dug deeper. And so I actually had the dichotomy. I, 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 I grew up Methodist, and, and Advent was, was actually more kind of a... Uh, uh, a festival process as opposed to a theological process, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, 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 as a child, I also went to Catholic school where it was a completely different view. Exactly. <laughs> I've been very structured and, and whatever. And so that always confused me, quite frankly. Yeah, I struggled that for 17 years at Philip. <laughs> Anybody else have any thoughts? Okay. Um, so let's see who else struggles with the meaning of Christmas and <laughs> the story of my life, right? <laughs> <laughs> summarizes where we might want to live. It's the beautiful task of Advent to awaken on all of us memories of goodness and thus to open the doors of hope, hope Benedict. And an all-time fave coming up. The Lord is coming, always coming. When you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you will recognize him at any moment of your life. Life is Advent. Life is recognizing the coming of the Lord. Henry Nguyen. 
So now we're gonna take a trip to the Middle Ages. <laughs> um, we'll go to the next slide where I drove yeah, that okay. way. We're gonna visit um, Hildegard von Bingen. Have any of you heard about Hildegard? She's kind of a cool lady. <laughs> I learned a new word as I was reading about her. I had never tripped over the term polymath. You ever heard that, that term? A, a person of great and varied learning. Um, she's also known as St. Hildegard. She was a German Benedictine abbess who was active as a writer, composer, philosopher, mystic, visionary, a medical writer, and a practitioner during the Middle Ages. Um, she's one of the best known composers of sacred chant, monophony, as we call it, um, one single line. Um, she's the most recorded um, scholar in modern history. And um, she was given to the church at the age of eight and entered uh, more the habit at age 15. But she had always been sick as a child and she claimed she saw the reflection of the living light at the age of three. And by the age of five, she began to understand that she was experiencing visions, a gift that she couldn't explain to others. She said that she saw all things in the light of God through the five senses, sight, hearing, test, smell, and touch. And some scholars have come to believe that Hildegard suffered from migraines and that the aura was the source of these visions, which I found really kind of interesting. I get migraines, but I never compose anything. So. <laughs> 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 um, her music was extremely important to her, and she describes it as a means of recapturing the original joy and beauty of paradise. So when we listen to this next, we can't listen to the whole thing because this whole Ave Generosa is like six minutes. Yes. Well, you said at the beginning that she was the most recorded scholar. Uh, com female composer of the Middle Ages. Oh, female. Yeah, female. female. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Tripped over that one. I no problem. Um, so the chant is it's typical. It's not typical of Gregorian chant. It has a lot of leaps in it. And it's very free and very expressive. So the one that we're gonna to listen to is Ave Generosa, and it's a hymn devoted to the Virgin Mary. And she creates this beautiful musical image of Mary as a glistening lily holding joy. So we'll listen to a couple of we'll listen to a little bit of this. different uh, it's a it's also voice for women's voices and men uh, uh, combined choirs this text is meant to be more deeply understood as being about the soul's relationship with God and or you can go back to the translation um, again a hymn, a hymn to the Blessed Mother when you watch this next um, recording it's act the girls are actually moving and when you get to the soloist and they and she puts they put their hands on her they're singing the one who pleased God. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we're going to jump to, this is a Norwegian girls choir called Our House, and it's really a beautiful setting in this text. Fascinating to watch. Also. I tripped over that and went, oh my God. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, it's just so exquisitely beautiful. Yeah. And then when you see yeah. the visual, it. And they, interesting, they all had their hair up. None, none of them had their hair flowing. That's one of the things I noticed. Also, uh, Yalo, um, Matt interviewed, do you remember that? What, during the COVID time, um, Matt kept the choir going. And one of the ways that he kept the choir going was to interview uh, online, live, Zoom, uh, noted modern uh, composers. And I remember I was in on, on that one. Uh, he thanks. has beautiful, sacred oh, music in the audience. Yes. And we've sung some of those anthems yes. there. But the yes. fact that I was able to find another yes. setting of the text was like, wow, yes. that's yes. Cool. And then when it's all the girls' choir and all the motion, wow. I said, it really works. Sure. So, um, any other thoughts about what you just listened to or saw? Okay. Yes. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> Hi. Hello, she said very artistic. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. I couldn't hear you. Even I was very easy. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. honey. Um, all right. So now, Audrey, do you, you want to talk about? Um, yeah. We so we're going to be art. we're going to be um, hearing a very unique piece in a minute. But um, one of the references, which I'm just going to go ahead and skip to it. So. Anybody, can anybody tell what this is? This image is like a lot, anybody? A gramophone. A gramophone. But what is in the gramophone? It's a little a lily. lily. A lily. A lily, yeah. My, my mom actually just bought a gramophone. She's wanted one for years. And so I just saw one over Thanksgiving. And you know, it's probably about the same size, with the, but with the lily. So the lily is something which comes up in medieval art. And in this work, which we're going to hear in a couple minutes, they're obviously quoting that. Um, so during the medieval as well as Renaissance art, they often use the lily um, in conjunction with Mary to talk about her purity, her chastity. But also we then get it later for Easter for us also kind of quoting that, but um, talking about the purity of Christ. And we have lots of quotes of different flowers kind of throughout Renaissance art. Um, you all might remember, well, you, you, if you don't, don't worry, but uh, there, was a, there was a sermon that I preached back in Lent where we looked at this big um, floral arrangement um, and it was quoting Ecclesiastes and it was like dying flowers mimicking kind of 
um, quoting Ecclesiastes. Well, same goes with Renaissance art, where we have um, pinks, so pink flowers, um, symbolizing stigmata, um, red roses symbolizing also Mary, but even more um, Jesus um, and his death and his blood. Um, but lilies are the ones which um, are most associated with Mary. So here we have two different pieces. Um, this first one's um, John Van Eyck um, with his The Annunciation. And then we also have another Annunciation by another um, lesser known medieval artist. So this is a, a sort of something that's used often in Renaissance art um, to, to note that Mary is different, setting her apart from other biblical characters. So similarly, we have here um, with the trumpet child, and do you want to? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. and have you listened to more of the Ave Generosa? And it goes on for seven or eight verses. She actually paints a, an image of Mary as a listening lily. So the lily kind of winds through all of our the music that we found. This was a fun discovery for both of us. I, I, we tripped over this one. Um, the trumpet child, as um, it's an album, and it's also titled one of the tracks is written by a husband and wife duo, an Ohio-based folk music band called Over the Rhine. So I don't know, have you ever heard of Over the Rhine? No, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the trumpet child, um, the lyrics, which you have, um, provide us with lots of wonderful imagery and a really unique um, take on Advent. If you look at the first verse, the lyrics in the first verse down the third line, they talk about the trumpet child will blow his horn with Gabriel's power and Satchmo's grace. It makes a reference to Louis Armstrong. And then if you go down to the third verse, the trumpet child will rip unloved Theolonius notes from above. It makes a reference to the jazz pianist. And the other thing I found interesting, and not necessarily related to this, is the trumpet is mentioned 118 times in the Old and New Testament. So it is a symbol of rejoicing and fanfare, um, but it's also a way to control, for the government to use it to control crowds. So we found that was interesting. I'm not going to talk about this. We're going to listen to it. And as you and you have a place to write some thoughts, any words, things pop into your head, just jot it down. I'll talk about it on the other side. Okay? And this is from the soundtrack.
pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> we thought so too. <laughs> uh, you notice anything about it? Any thoughts, comments? Reactions? Yeah. 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 In the first and the fourth verse, I find some hope because mm -hmm. the trumpet is going to be blasted till the sky is reborn mm -hmm. and nobody knows mm -hmm. how long it will take, right, right. but it will happen. Yeah, it will happen. Actually, one of the comments was sometimes hope hurts. Mm. <clears throat> and you notice anything about the ending? My musician friends. Anybody it doesn't it? resolve. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, what's it represent musically? What it represents musically is that the story is still ongoing and we are waiting for the rest of it. Amen. There it is. Thank you, Craig. I found that fascinating. We went through several recordings of this, and this this is from the track, and it was the best one. Yeah. And the phrase I find so interesting is that a lion lies be beside a lamb yep. and licks a murderer's outstretched hand. This is a keeper that I, I had never heard this before. Wow, that's I mean, this that's... is part of my journey with Audrey. Yeah. <laughs> we had so much fun going through all of these things. Um, this is really powerful. It's an interesting album. They're an interesting group. So, um, where did you find? How did you unearth? We just started gigging, you know, googling Advent music and things that. Sites popped up, and there's a wonderful site called Art and Theology, and um, this woman does uh, a Spotify playlist for Advent, and they're all off the wall things that you would never ever explore. And when I found this, I said, Audrey, we need to use this. And then when the cover popped up, so wow. like, what's the name of the Art artist? and Theology? Art and Theology. Um, Over the Rhine. And that's mm, the, band. the band. And they're named Over the Rhine because of the uh, section of Cincinnati that has referred to as OTR. I learned something new of that geographically as well. <laughs> so it's an interesting interesting group. It's a husband and wife team. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. But, okay. Oh, very cool. Good, 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 good. All right, so where are we going now? Oh, okay. So um, as we, we talked about, sometimes hope hurts. <clears throat> The next slide. Okay. Songs of holy longing for Christ coming into our dark and broken world to make all things new, with the hope that's at times joyful and at others pain, we cry that all the saints and prophets across the centuries come, Lord. Advent is a season of hope, writes the Reverend Fish Harris of Nora, and part of practicing hope is noticing where we need it. Advent is an opportunity for us to lean into the deep longing we feel for God's presence. And piggybacking on Marty's comment, um, Advent music can embrace the hard things about life, and again, it's been written, sometimes hope hurts. Although this next thing we're going to listen to is not an Advent piece of music, it's a beautiful musical prayer that speaks to the pain in our world and our prayer for resolution. Thank you. 
very emotional. Uh, and um, it, it really hit home for us when we went to synagogue a couple of weeks ago because there are several families in Morristown that have relatives and children serving in the IDF. Uh, the director, uh, the executive director of the synagogue at the New York, her son Jeremy is serving. Um, and then there are the cantor, my friend Billy, uh, many of her relatives are serving. And um, actually there's one family in Morrison has a relative that's a hostage. So it really hit home. And when I found this, I thought, we, and I shared it with Audrey, I said, we have to use it. You know? um, so I, I, first time I saw it, I was a puddle. <laughs> this really is actually the first time I've seen the entire performance, oh, yeah, because yeah, because really the things they've been showing on TV are so. Uh, Hello. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it just struck me how music enables the expression of human emotions. Mm -hmm. That was my next thing to say. Thank you. Yeah, music. <laughs> music can put into words things that we can't can't say. Um, actually, my daughter shared something with me. Um, there's a French word for "dong," and there's parts some of us that our brains are wired in such a way that respond so emotionally you get chills listening to music, and it happens to me all the time. I cry at Hallmark commercials. Um, it doesn't bother other people sometimes, but some some of us are wired in such a way that these things really kind of you know reduce you to an emotional mess. So um, I just think it's so powerful. So I, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, and that kind of brings us to Kate, back to Kate Bowler, who has this beautiful prayer. So God, these are darkening days with little hope in sight. Help us in our fear and exhaustion. Anchor us in hope. Blessed are we with eyes open to see the accumulated suffering of danger, sickness, and loneliness, the injustice of racial oppression, the unimpeded greed and misuse of power, violence, intimidation, and use of dominance for its own sake, the mockery of truth and disdain for weakness or vulnerability, and worse, the seeming powerlessness of anyone trying to stop it. Blessed are we who ask, where are you, God, and where are your people? the smart and sensible ones who fight for good and have the power to make it stick. Blessed are we who cry out, oh God, why does the bad always seem to win? When will good prevail? We know you are good, but we see so little goodness. God, show us your heart, how you seek out the broken. Lift us on your shoulders and carry us home, no matter how strong we think we are. God, seek us out and find us, we, your tired people, and lead us out to where hope lies, where your kingdom will come and your, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Fill us with your courage, calm us with your love, and fortify us with your hope. There's a little PS in the bottom. Open your hands as you release your prayers, then take hold of hope as a protest. And when I saw this, I thought of when Audrey taught us the Julian of Norwich prayer. You want to remind us how to do that? Oh, are you putting me on the spot? I can't remember exactly how it You got it? <laughs> await. When we put our hands await God's presence, however it comes, and to allow a sense of God's presence to come or not, whatever it is, accept as a gift whatever comes or not comes, and then attend to what you're called to be. So it kind of tied it in a beautiful knot for me in terms of things that we've learned from Audrey and our friend Kate. Um, so now, as we search for meaning, we're going to visit another one of our little friends and see if he can help us out. Line screen. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lunch, please. <laughs> and there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. 
the glory of the Lord shall round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Christmas is all about Charlie Brown. Okay. What did you notice about that clip? And first, we need to make sure that that's on the list of the gospel according to Charles Schultz. <laughs> well, I, I was interesting to find, I mean, he, he was not going to do this uh, project unless he, uh, the company was allowed him to talk about the birth of Jesus. Right. Charles Schultz was a very religious man. When did, did you notice anything? Yeah, I think the youngest one is telling the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What happens when Linus says, fear not? Did anybody catch that? I didn't. See, what you said, everybody knew that. I didn't. <laughs> Can we go to that spot? Yes. Can you find it? Watch what happens when he says, fear not. We all know he loves his blankie. Right, yeah. And to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. It shall be to all people. For unto you is born in this day in the city of David. So, the birth of... Yes, Paul. What? What did Craig say? I never saw that before. Then he dropped his <laughs> 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 he dropped the mic. I did not pick that up either when Audrey and I were talking about it. She goes, well, everybody knows about that. I said, well, let's find out. <laughs> so um, the significance of that, what do you think the significance of that is when he says you're not? His security blanket. He releases his security blanket. Yeah. 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 So, some of the things I tripped over, the birth of Jesus frees us from the habits we are unable or unwilling to break. Um, the world is a scary place and most of us find ourselves grasping for something that gives us a feeling of security. Um, and what's interesting is Linus starts speaking about Jesus and that he takes center stage and he wants the lights. Mm -hmm. So it's our prayer that it may be true for all of us that we put Jesus at center stage and, and give him the spotlight so that we can find peace and security. I just thought that's such a wonderful clip. I, that's one of my favorite Christmas movies. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to do something. Um, you didn't think we were going to get out of here without singing. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, Paul shared, you know, how music can create meaning and often expresses what we can't always put into words. So we're going to um, take a look at this hymn. It was written by Charles Wesley in 1744. And it looks to Jesus not only as God's love expressed in human form at the Incarnation, but to Jesus' return at the end of time when death will be no more. So I'm going to the piano, and you're all going to walk. And it's on the and right side of the back. And we're going to that long expected Jesus. <laughs> concert, concert.
ages, of the 1700s, and Charlie Brown. What kinds of thoughts or words come to you? Do you feel any differently after we've talked about this, or what, what speaks to you? Any thoughts? Any tie up with a bow? <laughs> Comments? Look for the surprise. Just look for the surprises. Oh, I love that. You know, look for the surprises. Look for the surprises. Mm -hmm. There is hope. There is hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's hard with everything that's going on to look for the surprises to find hope sometimes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? The word anticipation mm -hmm. stuck with me throughout the whole presentation. Anticipation of a new world, a new order, mm -hmm. peace. Mm -hmm. Anybody write down anything they want to share? Any particular? Oh, yes. The joy of what awaits us. The joy of what awaits us. The joy of what awaits us. Okay. Look for the surprises, the joy that awaits us, anticipation, all good things. It's, it, it's also the idea that, that, that they use the, the, the metaphor of the heart as, as the way where all that begins inside of us. Mm -hmm. The longing heart, uh, the, the rule in our hearts alone, et cetera. Mm -hmm. not, to, not to throw a damper on this, but I personally have difficulty with the concept of hope because hope to me means that you're expecting something and I'm very fearful of disappointment, mm -hmm. okay? okay? What happens if you hope for something and it doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. I, I, so, you know, I, I, I try to hope and, pardon the phrase, disappointment be damned, mm -hmm. but, you know, if, if, if what we hope for doesn't come, mm -hmm. I'm afraid to hope because of the fear, because of the disappointment. Mm -hmm. You're not. I know. He's <laughs> <It's laughs> yeah. no, yeah, yeah, Another way to think about it, though, is when you have more and more and more of your population hoping, it actually begins to cause a, a different pathway you know, for the place where the world is going. Mm -hmm. So, That's true. Yeah. yeah, so you, you can actually affect the outcome, I think, when hope becomes very pervasive and, and very, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's like the power of prayer. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the gifts I, I received from my previous principal, Sister Patricia, and she's just words of wisdom all the time. It kind of goes back to what you're talking about. She's told me, she said, Michelle, you learn, you need to learn to trust. And that walks with me every day. Trust mm -hmm. in the Lord with all your heart. Um, when things get crazy, she says, you have to trust. You know, okay. Mm -hmm. And then her other favorite I will share with you is just you today. In the week between. <laughs> yeah. She lives among all of us. I get her, that was her mantra. Just do the day. I said, Sister, I'm doing the next 20 minutes. This is good. <laughs> and the linkage between hope and faith is, is, is a very important linkage. And I think we often don't actually realize that that hope has to be an embedded part of our faith mm -hmm. and and we have faith you know, for our reasons every individual person has, has a different reason for having their faith but hope's got to be an embedded part of that right. um, somebody once said to me that the difference between expectations and hope was that hope was expectations without a pre-written conclusion Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Mm. Some jotting down his words. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are wonderful. <laughs> that's a bumper stick. Yeah, that's a bumper stick. <laughs> that's, a bumper stick. <laughs> that's really good. Well, I, I can't thank Audrey enough for um, palling up with me. Um, I learned a lot. You know, I was living in music and academic land and, you know, spiritually kind of surfacey. Yeah, I know what Advent's about. But being able to dig into this and kind of explore some of your different kinds of music and, and making connections artistically. You know, we see these things, but I, we don't always connect the dots, you know? Um, so that was really powerful. So I'm, 
really grateful. I'm really grateful for your oh, help. Thank I send these beautiful slides that my partner and friend prepared. I am technologically challenged, I admit it. She did. I would say this was an absolutely wonderful presentation. The fact <laughs> that it was also accompanied by Arthur D. Two's third cousin as our uh, speaker. <laughs> <laughs> really, really cool. Morning. I just wanted to say what a good presentation it was. And really I nice. wish that everybody could hear this. Um, Rich Schwartz is doing um, Spring Hills, mm -hmm. and I'm flying today. And um, he said to me, I think the people really love to sing, sing. So he wanted to do Christmas carols, and he said, I personally like to do the Advent carols, but they're not as well known. Right, right. And for the people that probably, uh, many of them didn't even grow up singing so many Christmas carols, uh, in the Catholic Church, we don't sing as much. Mm -hmm. And so we're singing, you know, Away in a Manger and Silent mm -hmm. Night. It's and blurry, it's okay. You know, <laughs> um, so because he felt that they wouldn't know the Advent. So I feel very blessed that I was here oh, to have my Advent <laughs> before I go here. And I, I just wish everybody could hear this. It's so much more, it makes Christmas so much more meaningful. Yes. Yes. Well, it did for me. You know, I think, you know, I'm so involved in choir that sometimes the, the, the spiritual part gets separated. And so this is a wonderful, not that I'm not grounded in faith, but you get so busy trying to prepare the anthems and do all that stuff. And even in my teaching, when I had to do, when I was at Bella Walsh, we did a live nativity. The second half of the concert, that was etched in stone. It was a whole nativity. Uh, and I was married to that. Um, and so that was a gift. And, and then being able to do this and kind of, you know, be introspective in my own faith. What is this really all about? And I myself get caught up, okay, we've got to make this meal, this has to be good, or this has to be good. We get caught in the crazy, and we forget what we're supposed to, supposed to be focusing on. So, um, again, thank you. thank you for making me do this, Audrey. I almost backed out. <laughs> it's always good to force people to do this, right? <laughs> thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. And next week we have Craig. Craig, do you have anything you want to share about next week, or anything we should be doing in preparation for next week? Well, uh, my uh, program for next week is actually for us to migrate to the chapel area and to open up our hymnals. And I'm going to uh, have us share about some of the uh, Advent and Christmas hymns that are in our hymnals that are often overlooked. And um, uh, just to kind of amplify a little bit on, on what Michelle uh, did today, uh, what I would like for you to uh, be mindful of is what are you noticing fresh from uh, particularly the lyrics in the hymns and uh, what stands out to you? Um, Advent and Christmas are times of contrasts. So uh, my, my theme is, is, is going to be one of what contrast do you see in the Advent and Christmas uh, music repertoire? So we're going to have a, a little easel and uh, participation of jotting down what type of contrast you see in some of the more overlooked uh, Advent and Christmas music. I think your title of your presentation should be, Do You Hear What I Hear? <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be taken up so many levels. <laughs> For those that don't know, he's an audiologist. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you didn't sign in, please sign in. Um, but thank you all for being thank here. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, my partner. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh,
Yeah. I can read it. I mean, it's over, but yeah, I can read it. It's going to be um, a little bit later okay. in the